Hi everyone, welcome to the Saker Musings podcast with me, Phil Saker. It's the 7th of March 24, it's episode 119, and today we're looking at why they still think they are the good guys. So welcome to the podcast today, everyone. In the main topic today, we're looking at why it is that our elites, you know, the politicians, the media and so on, still think after all the evidence of what's happened over the last few years, that they're the good guys. You know, why in the Western world, we seem to have this sort of unshakable belief that we are the good guys. And and Western politicians, I think, you know, used to use that to justify everything that they want to do. Well, we're the good guys. So whatever we do is right. Why is it that they they have that belief? And that's what we're going to be coming on to um, in the main topic. Now, I just uh, before we get going, I just like to to uh, give a little note. If anyone particularly has recently come on to the podcast, I like to do this occasionally just to explain what we're all about. And I thought this is a good opportunity to do it today because I've had a a little bit of a rebrand. I've been working on my website. I've changed the slogan of the podcast. It was. Um, it was building on Christian foundations, which is quite general. I mean, it was fair enough, quite general. But I thought I'd, cha- I'd change it to uh, Jesus is the only safe and effective foundation. And I thought that kind of brings together uh, the, the two things that I'm trying to, to work on, which is really thinking about Jesus and thinking about the Christian faith and how we build on that foundation as a society um, and, and how that's been corrupted in the world and particularly with the safe and effective vaccine narrative. But of course, talking about much more than that, uh, not just the, uh, the vaccines, of course. Um, so that's what that's what I do on the podcast. You know, I'm just trying to analyse the world, thinking about what's happening and thinking about how uh, the Christian faith and, and Jesus sort of speaks into what's happening in the world and how actually if we depart from that Christian foundation then we get the problems that we've seen and we need to return to that foundation in order to to move what move on and move forward as a society so yeah I've changed this, I've changed the slogan I've also changed the um, the podcast picture you might have noticed in your podcast provider it looks a bit different hopefully a little bit better it also means now annoyingly that I need to change the other one on my um, other channel on understand the bible because that's looking a bit tired now so I need to get <laughs> I need to get working on that but anyway um yeah if you appreciate the podcast then uh please do if you're on youtube do the like and subscribe thing if you're watching this without having subscribed um i will say that youtube do seem to be doing something really funny like i think they're throttling the podcast i think i've noticed it every time someone subscribes someone unsubscribes like it's just like a pattern it just keeps on happening and if it happened just kind of once or twice i could understand but you know i've been stuck on the same number um, for for ages now and I think it's because YouTube have, have throttled me so if you're going to share it please do share it on social media or on telegram or whatever I have a telegram channel um, but you might like to point people to the audio podcast which is you know not kind of restricted um, so you know, if people get their podcast that way but you can obviously subscribe on YouTube and I, I had uh, set up with Odyssey and with Rumble but I, I don't really use those so much just at the moment. Um, but anyway, we'll, 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 we'll see how that kind of works out. <clears throat> I'll let you know if anything changes on that. Um, there are also other ways of supporting the podcast. If you'd like to support me and my family, then there's a Give, Send, Go. Uh, I recently uh, moved to Give, Send, Go for, uh, for all donations. So um, thanks so much to everyone who has given in that way. And I'd love to hear your... Uh, your thoughts, your comments, all of that, uh, you can email me through at sacredmusingspod at gmail.com or you can telegram me or you can leave a comment either on YouTube or on my website. Uh, So do get in touch and uh, let me know what you think. If there's anything that you'd like me to, any articles that you've seen that you'd like to share, anything like that, and do join in as well. So thanks so much everyone for for listening. Um, what I always do on the podcast is I start out with some, you know, I say news, but it's really just interesting articles, things that I've seen over the last week, not necessarily new, not necessarily current news topics, but just things which have made me think. And then we'll move on to the main topic and then we finish with a little bit uh, from the Bible, uh, usually on the podcast. So 
This week, let me share with you what I've been looking at this last week. Um, oh, this is an article which was um, published today by James Bartholomew in The Telegraph. Uh, the NHS is our national shame. It's time to abolish it. So this is um, riffing on um, uh, Jeremy Hunt's comments uh, from yesterday, the, the budget yesterday, that the NHS is the biggest reason that we are, uh, so, uh, the biggest reason most of us are proud to be British. And um, this article is just kind of tearing that to shreds and saying that if you compare the NHS with most other European countries, then the NHS is worse. Like if you compare, for example, um, what happens to cancer um, patients, people who are diagnosed with cancer, then I think relative to other European countries, there are about we're about ten thousand people worse, you know, who die before other countries, if you like. So it's it's pretty bad. And why is it that the uh, the the Tories and Labour and you know that all the politicians just keep on saying this about the NHS? It's it's like it's an idol. And I, I think it needs to fall if we are going to make progress. If we're actually going to get better healthcare, we need the NHS to fall, I think. Um, and, and it's, you know, this is the thing. Like, I uh, came came to this perhaps, you know, as as many of us did into, you know, 2020, thinking that the it was, you know, either the NHS or the American system. That's how the media like to present it. It's either the NHS or America. And if you actually compare the NHS with most of Europe, which is a much different model of healthcare, sort of an insurance kind of system, government-backed insurance system with local individualised um, private healthcare, uh, then it works much better. And you know, why is it that we're kind of stuck with this monolithic nationalised system, which just sucks in more money and doesn't deliver? Um, but there we go. That's 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 part of the problem. Um, so the thing the NHS has to fall, I think. Okay, um, next one. Oh, it's Panda. So I've mentioned Panda several times. Um, this is what they published uh, last week, I think. The nature of the events of the COVID era. A detailed summary of Panda's current understanding. And what they're arguing is that there was no pandemic. There was not even a novel virus. They are saying there wasn't a lab leak and, and so much of this is kind of mistaken. Now, you may or may not agree, but I think what they are saying, if I just scroll down here, saying that uh, what did spread, what they say is that uh, Panda contends that the harms to health we have witnessed are iatrogenic in nature and or consequences of the response to the detection of that novel signal and absent its detection, nothing unusual would have been noticed. So what they say is that it's to do with the the way that healthcare was done is what caused all of the, the harms to health. It was the response, in other words, to COVID which caused the problems. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense that you know, what is it that caused COVID, in inverted commas, to spike in March 2020 um, when it was circulating, as we know, prior to that, and, and I think I had something nasty in uh, December 2019 and I know a lot of people did in, or in um, early 2020. So what is it that caused all the deaths? Well it, it most likely wasn't Covid or whatever we've, we've come to call Covid. And what the reason that they say this matters, let me just quote you one more paragraph, it says Panda maintains it is a mistake to blame a virus when the true culprits are those who fashioned and propagated a false narrative. Using the analogy of Jon Snow and the 1854 Broad Street cholera outbreak, it is this false narrative and not a virus which is the pump handle which we need to remove. So what they're saying is, again, if, if we think it's to do with a virus, then we'll point the finger at the wrong target, that it's the people who propagated the narrative at, which created the problem, all of the problems, really, as they're arguing. Now, I still don't quite know, you know, I think there are different positions and I've seen from within the, you know, the so-called sceptical community, community, the lockdown sceptic community, whatever you want to call it. There are different positions on this, but it does seem to me more and more that, you know, we need to 
to be pointing the finger at the politicians and the the people who stand behind you know thinking about the wef the who um and, and into china and so on thinking about who is actually responsible rather than getting sidetracked thinking about well was was covid created in a lab was it a you know natural spiller event and all of that was it a bioweapon i mean that's in a sense that is kind of immaterial it was the response which which seems to be the the biggest the, the thing that which we should be targeting and um yeah I, I thought that was quite a helpful paper um okay let me run through a few videos that I've, I've i've seen which are really uh helpful um the first one i think is an absolute must watch this is a uh, half an hour from russell brand saying that the ukraine war lie just collapsed this changes everything that's the title of the video but he was uh, looking at an article, I think, published in the New York Times, basically admitting that the CIA had been at work in uh, in Ukraine prior to the the invasion and um, in the events of 2014 and so on. You know, the the Americans, the CIA, helped the Ukrainians to do assassinations, for example. And they help them with 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 these things. Not not so much taking responsibility, I think, directly with the Americans, but helping the Ukrainians to do things. And you know, it, it just seems again that this this whole narrative of Putin is just a a madman, and the war was totally unprovoked. That was the the lie, and we know it's just totally not true. And I know that I've been saying this for a while, but what Russell Brand said, I think, in the article that he was um, he was quoting from, absolutely, yeah, it, it completely destroys the whole Ukraine um, narrative. So, yeah, do do have do have a look at that. I can't really add to what Russell Brand said. Um, next thing, oh yeah, so I've been looking into to Joe Cox, and this isn't new. This isn't a new thing, but uh, I was chatting to a friend of mine. Um, the other day and uh who's a listener of the podcast hello louise and uh she was telling me about watching this documentary about joe cox uh, a few years ago and i i watched it this last week so it's richard hall the first thing he did was a a lecture about the joe cox assassination and that's available on youtube so you can have a look at that that's only an hour and that's kind of a, a more brief lecture and then he did a, a fuller documentary, which is about three hours long, um, which is on his available on his website or on um, Odyssey. I think you can find it in, in different places if you uh, you Google it. And um, I watched that as well after the the, um, the the lecture that he did. But yeah, what he argues, looking at the looking at the evidence, is that uh, Joe Cox was. Well, Tommy Mayer, who was put in prison for the killing, he almost certainly wasn't the killer. The, there were, um, the testimony did not you know, add up from the police and from other people. There, I mean, there were a lot of different strands to it. But in my, you know, a few, a few weeks ago, I wrote a thing on my blog about why Christians should be, you know, inverted commas, conspiracy theorists. And what I said there is believe the eyewitnesses you know, this is not about theories about, you know, looking at looking at evidence in different ways. This is actually looking at people and looking at what people say, what they've said and what they, you know, and, and it, the people who know Tommy Mayer said that he wasn't, they didn't even know his political beliefs. His brother said he didn't know what he thought politically. You know, he wasn't someone who was a violent man. He was a gentleman. He loved cats. You know, he was he was a loner, but he wasn't an extremist. And um, you know, he wasn't a murderer. And if you look at into, um, for example, what happened at the trial, you know, no, uh, no pictures of the, the body were presented. You know, the, the body was actually taken down to London, which is very unusual um, and, and so on and, uh, and so forth. So you know, all sorts of irregularities. Um, the policeman who did the arrest of Tommy Mayer, you know, th there was something odd about their testimony um and the the woman who took joe to joe cox to the in the car to where, where she was killed or allegedly killed um again there was something odd about that 
So instead of dialing 999 when it happened, she dialed the number of the police chief inspector who who had given her the, his number some some weeks ago, you know, and, and you think, well, why on earth would you not dial 999 in that situation? Who would do that? There's all of these odd things put together. You know, it just seems to me like it was a, it was a stitch up. It was a, you know, that uh, Joe Cox, whether she was, I mean, I, I suspect that she wasn't actually killed, you know, that, that she was um, just perhaps, you know, given a new identity or something. I don't know. Um, but you know, as I was watching it, I think the the thing which, again, I uh, I've had these experiences so many times over the last few years is that I I never thought the British establishment would do such a thing, you know, to to frame a murder as it were and frame someone, put him in prison for for committing a murder. I I never thought that would happen. I thought that we believed in justice. I thought that we believed in, you know, the, the rules for everyone. But no, that's, it turns out that's not the case, it seems. And I mean, that when I watched the, um, the documentary that evening, I was uh, walking around looking, looking behind my back, just thinking, well, is there someone behind me going to, you know, stitch me up for something, frame me and, and put me in prison? Because if it can happen to, I know that you know they would they would probably defend this, saying, well, it was it was a national security matter, perhaps whatever Joe Cox was involved with, we don't know. Um, Richard Hall thought it was to do with the Panama files that she was threatening to expose. But what was what was going on there, we don't know. But they they would, I'm sure, have some way of defending it. But that's the thing: if if it can happen to to her, it can happen to anyone. You know, if they, if they find an appropriate reason, perhaps they might think me or you are a security risk. We're a risk to national security. Oh, well, bye bye. Then you disappeared. You know, they frame someone else for the murder. I, I don't know. You know, this is this is the problem that I've I've completely and utterly lost faith in the moral nature of our government and of our of our elites you know absolutely it's just dropped off the bottom's fallen out of it i don't think there are no lows to which they will not stoop so long as they think they can get away with it and actually that kind of leads on to what we're thinking about in the main topic today um but yeah do have a look at the documentary um have a look at the lecture if you haven't got the the full time or the the fuller documentary if you want um they're very informative and um i think very i think it's pretty conclusive actually so let me move on now. Um, oh, so there was an, an interview here on trigonometry with uh, Kelsey Sharon. She is a combat veteran. She was in the Canadian military and served in um, Afghanistan. And I think what what I just found the most the thing which struck me most about that was how it seems like our politicians again going back to the moral nature of our politicians. Our politicians seem to think that war is now a strategy. You know, war in Ukraine, war in Gaza, you know, war against terror, all of that. That war is now an appropriate strategy. It's part of our strategy. And what um, Kelsey Sharon was was saying as a veteran is that they don't they don't know what it's like to be a soldier. You know, they don't know what it's like. War is a terrible. It's a, it's a horrid thing. You know, no one in their right mind would actually want to go to want to go to war. You know that war is is horrible, and yet why are our politicians seemingly happy to engage in it? And you know, you get you. I mean, I, I just find it so disgusting. The pictures of uh, Rishi Sunak shaking hands with you know, with his arm round Zelensky. You know, oh, we've just given another another billion to to Ukraine to give them more arms to bomb the you know the Russians with, and and it's like on the ground. Do you not understand what is happening? Do you not understand there are people dying? You know, there are people having to pick up burnt corpses off the ground. There are there are wives. There are children who are missing their fathers. There are you know there are schools that have been bombed. There are um, you know, people's homes, it's, it's, it's just a, an absolute disgrace, the way that this is carrying on. And, you know, looking at what, what she said, it's, it's just that human cost, 
you know, the human cost of war. We've completely lost that. It's war, war has just become an abstract thing, which politicians engage in because it's convenient for them, for the narrative, but not actually, they're not thinking about the people involved. And, you know, I think we need to get back to actually thinking and caring about, you know, people. Okay, so let me uh, let me move on. Just a couple more things. So, oh yes, there was an article here, interesting article. I know I've mentioned Nadra Bridgen um, a couple of times recently. And um, it turns out that Navina Bridgen, his wife, uh, they're, they're now divorced or they're, they're getting divorced, they're separated. And um, Navina Bridgen wrote an article in the Sunday Times, or at least he was interviewed in the Sunday Times, um, by Caroline Wheeler. Uh, this was published on um, March the 2nd, so uh, yeah, just um, not long ago. But basically saying um, that her husband, Andrew, had been captured by these anti-vax sort of conspiracy groups. And uh, I just think it's kind of interesting, you know, how uh, he seems to be have been attacked on all sides, even by his, well now his, his ex-wife, and accused of being, you know, uh, into all of these conspiracy theories. It just seems like the, the attempt to discredit him as stepped up a notch that even his you know his his former wife is now accusing him of all of these things and uh you know it does seem to me to be a real smear campaign and it's it's a real shame i mean but it, it, it does make me think again though that as i said just because someone is on the side of the truth doesn't mean that they are a good and, and nice and pleasant person as it were, that I'm sure there were real problems in the marriage, which is why uh, Navina would have, you know, turned against him. Um, and you know, perhaps this is this is part of the the issue. But you know, it just it just made me think that you know, so just because someone is on in the within the truth community, the sceptical community, does not mean that they're a good and kind person. And um, you know the, the, that it's possible to be on the side of seeking the truth while at the same time being unpleasant to your wife and, and child. I don't know what, what, what happened in, in that case, but I think it's, you know, as always, it's, it's worth just trying to, uh, you know, reserve judgment, I suppose, until the, the full facts are known. And uh, certainly, uh, I would say with someone like Andrew Bridgen, or with anyone really, you know, we don't put our trust in people, do we? You know, we don't put our complete trust in anybody. You know, not me, not you not not our neighbours, you know, that, that we do, I hope we do have trust, but, but actually our complete trust is reserved for God alone, because people can let us down, and, uh, you know, we have to, at the end of the day, we have to remember that everyone is 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 fallen, and that we need to trust in, in God alone. Okay, um, so this is just uh, a couple more things, just, this is something that I wrote this week, um, on my blog, should Christians support Israel? And I felt that I, I just needed to write this. Every time I, I hear about, I've been hearing, you know, watching interviews and things about what's been going on and people's response. And I just feel there is a, I mean, I've tried to say this on the podcast and what, what I say in the article, in the, the blog post is basically what I've been saying here on the podcast, which is it's not a matter of taking sides. It's not a matter of saying, well, we are Western, therefore we, we support Israel, or we are you know, Christians, therefore we support the Jews, but actually looking at what the, the transcendent moral values are which God has given us, and actually saying you know, we need to compare both Hamas and Israel to those same moral standards, and indeed ourselves in the Western world. And this is what um, I want to be, to be doing today. But that's that's what I was trying to say. But particularly, I was looking at the Christian, the biblical angle, because I think a lot of Christians say, well, the Jews are mentioned, you know, Israel's mentioned in the Bible. The Jews are mentioned in the Bible. They're God's special people. Therefore, we need to support them sort of unconditionally. And what I wanted to argue very strongly in this piece is that that's not the case. I do not believe that this is demonstrable from the Bible. In fact, I think it's sort of the, the opposite, really. Um, 
And I, I, I'm not a Christian Zionist, and I, I just wanted to explain why that was and look at the relevant, some of the relevant um, arguments from the Bible. There's so much you could say, um, but I wanted to look into that. So if that would be helpful for you, do have a look on my blog. Um, and um, I think there is sort of a, a, a secular version of this as well, which is, you know, that. So that was a pigeon on the roof or, or a bird of some kind on the roof there. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think there is a secular version of this, which is that we should support Israel because they're Western. So they're our allies. And I think the Christian version is we should support them because they're Jewish. Uh, the, the secular version is we should support them because they're Western. And I think both of those are mistaken. But this is particularly looking at the, the Christian angle. One final thing. just This is just one of those little stories which I thought was quite funny. Uh, which I just wanted to mention to close with as a bit of a laugh. Um, on the Daily Skeptic published um, uh, yesterday, migrants are so miserable in Britain, they're desperate to leave, but we won't let them. I thought that was hilarious that they um, they interviewed a couple of migrants and they said that, you know, it's, it's horrible here and uh, that they, they tried to escape illegally back, at, you know, get back to Dover and they've been caught by the police and taken back to where they were being held. And I thought, oh, my word, this... But it, it did make me think, you know, that perhaps the these, you know, bleeding heart, virtue-signalling lefties, as it were, who just want to welcome every everyone who claims to be an asylum seeker with open arms will actually do more to put them off than the Rwanda plan. Because you can't... 600 people turning up in a week on dinghies, and you cannot house have that keep coming over and, and expect them to there to be living in good living conditions and, and so on and so forth you cannot do it and the conditions are going to have to are going to deteriorate and that's kind of what what i think is the word maybe is beginning to get back and perhaps that will deter more people from coming so perhaps you know it will actually work out in a in a funny sort of a way but there we go that's that's just kind of a, a little a little laugh so let's turn uh, turn on now to the, the main topic. Let's think about our leaders and why they still think they're the good guys. So as I, as I was saying, over the last few, um, few years, the bottom has sort of completely dropped out of, of my, expect, my moral expectations for the government, uh, for Western governments. You know, I used to think there was a line that they wouldn't cross, but now I, I, I don't think there's anything they wouldn't do if they really, you know, thought they could get away with it. It seems like the, the main difference between the West and, you know, Hamas, for example, is that the West like to pretend they make a big song and dance about human rights, uh, but actually they they don't, you know, when, when they think nobody's looking, and increasingly now in full public view, they just flout human rights and, and so on. And, and this is, you know, this is the problem that, Western leaders, they seem to have an unshakable operating assumption that they are the good guys. And I, I put a picture of Justin Trudeau up there. But, you know, I think you could apply this to any Western uh, leader, really, at the moment, certainly in the, the Anglosphere. Um, and I think this explains why enemies of the West, or so-called enemies of the West anyway, like Putin are portrayed as kind of deranged madmen like you know the way that when russia invaded ukraine you know it was it was portrayed as oh this is utterly unprovoked you know putin is just a madman he just wants to to take back russia he just wants to you know and and there was nothing about what the cia had been doing the context of what america and the cia had been doing in ukraine prior to that um and again you know i think with israel there has been, uh, again, this is not to, not to excuse in any way, shape, or form the the evil that was done by Hamas, but there's been this sort of almost unconditional siding with Israel amongst. Actually, I mean that's not quite true because there has been a lot of, you know, tension in in the parliament about you know Israel Gaza and, and so on, but it does seem like there is this kind of unwillingness to actually criticise. Israel for any of its its actions, uh, which would not, I think, apply to, to other nations. Um, I think that's because Israel is seen as a Western nation. Um, so, you know, we are unwilling to say, well, um, you know, the, 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 we, we think that, you know, these are moral problems here as well. 
Um, and the problem is with this view that when you think you have this unshakable view that you're the good guys, then that gives you permission, moral permission to do whatever you like. Because well, I can't, I'm not doing the wrong thing because I'm the good guy here. I can do whatever. You know, I can, you know, um, have someone locked up for life for murder, even though they didn't do it because I'm the good guy. You know, it's, it was the right thing to do. It's in the national security interest. Uh, we can have, you know, that uh, 3,000 people die in a terror attack, you know, with the Twin Towers, for example, because, now, hey, we're the good guys. You know, we are, it's, it's, it's leading on to, a, you know, it's the greater good. You know, we're going to go and we're going to wage war on terror. We're going to stamp out all the terrorists. So 3,000 people dying in a, in a terror attack is a small price to pay. I think that is the kind of calculation that they do. And they do it because they think they are the good guys. They are morally unimpeachable. So what is it that enables our leaders, our political class, our elites, the media? There is some kind of group. And Matt Goodman calls them the elites. And I think that's probably as, as good a name as any. So what is it that enables them to continue in this deluded belief? Because I think surely any... Any independent outside observer would see that would see now that Western leaders have routinely failed to uphold human rights. And I think if any you know sort of outside independent observer looking at the lockdowns, looking at the vaccine mandates, looking at the wars and the terrorism and 9-11, Joe Cox and all of those things, could look and see that Western nations have fallen short of the moral standards which they they themselves claim to hold. So why is it that our political leaders can't see that? Why is it? Well, I've got three things that I wanted to talk about here. Three reasons. The first reason is the power of self-delusion. Um, this is, a, if you're watching this on, on uh, YouTube, that picture there is a picture of Joseph Goebbels, Hitler's uh, propagandist. And he is reported to have said, uh, repeat a lie often enough and it becomes the truth. I don't think he actually said that, but it was the kind of, I think it's it's one of these quotes which is quite, quite uh, good because it's, I think it has a, more than a grain of truth in, in it. Repeat a lie often enough and it becomes the truth. You think about all of the slogans which our government have promulgated over the last few years. Safe and effective, of course, being the perhaps the, the most significant of those. Or stay at home, protect the NHS, save lives. Now, those things are questionable at best, but they they have been repeated so often that I think people have started to believe them. I think it's because people think, well, if they, if it keeps being repeated so much, it must be true because they must have some evidence to back up that claim. They're clearly not going to... I think it relies on people's good faith, actually, that others are not lying. Um, but it's, it's self-delusion in the end because you're accepting the word of a slogan rather than looking into all of the evidence. Um, I think it's, it, it goes also for things like renewable energy, you know, that, that how the government seem to think that we can power the country entirely on wind power and other forms of unreliable renewable energy, which is which is just not true. It's a delusion. And similarly with electric cars, you know, how there there is this, again, un unshakable belief that electric cars are better than petrol cars for carbon when as I, uh, I was reading an article on the daily skeptic actually yesterday that said they actually produce more carbon output if you you know look at everything uh, but certainly you know there are massive problems with the mining of of the batteries the materials for the batteries and so on and so so it's it's clearly electric cars are you know not green in the sense that they are you know, the, the green lobby wants them to be green. But it's just this lie which is just told. And things like Islamophobia as well. Now, how is it that only uh, a week after the um, the Islamist kind of protesters shut down 
Parliament or, or, or changed what was happening in Parliament, that the debate then shifted to Islamophobia as if that's the biggest threat and as if the, the far right are a, a, as big a threat as the Islamists and, and so on and so forth. You know, it just, I just feel like it's kind of this fantasy world, this, this self-delusion. They're not living in the real world. They're not living at the actual evidence. And this is this is what's happening. The, it is possible to delude yourself if you don't ask too many questions. You know, that if you just read the mainstream media, I was, I mentioned this last week, how when I was at my um, in-laws a, a couple of weeks ago, I, I just picked up, um, they, they get a, a mainstream media newspaper, I just picked it up and read it, and it was like stepping into an alternate universe, because so many things were just said there, assumed to be true, without, and I happen to know that they're not, or they're, they're questionable at best, it's like stepping into this alternate universe, and that's so much the BBC, everything, it's all, you know, it's the narrative, isn't it, rather than the truth. One funny example of this, this gave me a bit of a laugh. But, you know, um, Matthias Desmet, who was um, came up with this idea of mass formation psychosis, this idea that people go mad in, in crowds, you know. Well, he didn't originate the idea, but he did a lecture about it, which got popular a while back. Uh, if you Google or search for mass formation psychosis, the top results on search engines are how it's been discredited. And I just thought, oh, that that's so that's so ironic. That's just a picture of it, isn't it? Mass formation psychosis, Google it. Oh, it's been discredited. Oh, well, that's all right then. Had me worried there for a second. <laughs> you know, I think it just goes to explain how it's, how these things work. So that was the first thing. The second thing is the power of these new religions. Now, why is it that so many of our elites are committed to this woke religion? You know, woke in inverted commas. I, I, again, it's difficult to know what to call it. Critical social justice, I think. Um, was it Andrew Doyle was saying? Anyway. Uh, but, you know, the anti-racism, climate change, LGBTQIA++, and all of that... Why is it that they are absolutely committed to this new religion? Well, what do you do when you feel a sense of guilt but can't acknowledge it? When you feel guilty but you can't acknowledge it? Well, I believe that what you do is you deflect it. So you deflect that guilt by acknowledging a totally different kind of guilt. I think that is what's going on. So this is why politicians were so key. They were falling over themselves to listen to St. Greta say, how dare you? You know, you've stolen, stolen my future. They were falling over themselves to hear Greta say how terrible they'd all been. But they won't actually admit personal responsibility, personal moral responsibility. This is how it goes. They own up to these largely imaginary, corporate, acceptable sins. And then that means they, they don't have to own up to the real and personal unacceptable sins. Now, personal morality is off the table. They can't admit those sins. So they instead, they own up to these imaginary sins, which, which conveniently, they don't actually have to take... Um, personal responsibility for because it's corporate responsibility you know it's systemic racism it's you know the, the failure of the government when it comes to climate change it's, it's not a personal thing we haven't been personally racist we're not personally responsible for the policy on climate change it's the government's failure and i think this is where the this is this religious angle because this has just been ever since the days of you know, of the bible the bible talks about this this is a substitute for genuine repentance. But if you self-flagellate enough to the new religions, you can ignore the real guilt of ignoring the truth. But these new religions, they're not really new. This has been, this has been going on since time immemorial. People wanting to impose harsh rules on themselves to self-flagellate in a different way so they can, uh, it can ease their guilt about real moral failure. 
Let me quote you a couple of verses here from, from the Bible. This is Colossians 2.23. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. I thought that this was really interesting actually looking at um, what was what's, what's going on sort of with woke you know the appearance of wisdom self-imposed worship false humility harsh treatment of the body and that does sound a little bit like some of the things that are going on you know with um you know with work, like, like the 15 minute cities oh yes well it's less convenient you know that in some ways we're going to impose rules but it's it's for the greater good it's for climate change you know we're going to save the planet so you know we all have to impose these rules. Of course, the elites don't have to abide by the rules. But anyway, that's that's by the by. Um, another Bible verse, uh, two Corinthians seven verse ten: Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. And this is where Paul talks about the two different kinds of uh, sorrow. There's godly sorrow which brings repentance you know a change in behavior but there's worldly sorrow which is uh, just leads to death and, and that worldly sorrow is just making a big song and dance about how sorry you are about something but leading to no actual change and um, I mean I think unfortunately the Church of England is the prime example of this just at the moment with their approach to safeguarding amongst other things because they've made such a song and dance about the way that they've handled uh, safeguarding failures in the past. But nothing is actually changing. No one has got the blame. No one is, you know, no one is being held accountable. And it's it's just this exactly this worldly sorrow. It's, you know, wailing, weeping, gnashing of teeth, saying, oh, how terribly sorry we all are. You know, mistakes were made. Lessons will be learnt. Nothing changes that's that's worldly sorrow and that's in the church of england not not let alone what's happening in in parliament and elsewhere so those are two of the three things the third thing that um the reason why our our elites can continue to think they're the good guys is i want to look at the sin of presumption now presumption this is a sin which we don't talk about much anymore i've mentioned it on the podcast before but it can be summed up in the, I think, the, the dying words of Heinrich Heine, who said, of course, God will forgive me. That's his job. It's this, this presumption that whatever we've done, God will forgive us anyway, because God's a nice kind of a chap. God's a forgiving kind of a chap. So God will just forgive me, won't he? And I think this is where, this is where Protestantism, I think, has gone wrong now back at the time of the reformation the protestant churches rightly emphasized that we are saved what they what the, the words that they use were sola fide you know by faith alone they emphasize that we are saved by faith alone and that is i believe biblical and right however protestant churches the, the heirs of the reformation they have not emphasised and insisted that we need to live by faith. You know, we need to live new lives by faith. And what has happened is that we've ended up with a church that basically preaches forgiveness without any moral standards. So whatever you've done, ah, oh, it doesn't matter. You know, God will forgive you. God doesn't care how you live. Doesn't matter. There's no moral standards. Do what you like. God will forgive you. Uh, unless something is really terrible in which case it's a safeguarding issue but we will we'll come on to that another time but you think about it you know what moral standards does the church hold out anymore particularly you know protestant churches like the church of england it seems to me that the the catholic church actually i think has done a much better job in standing up against things like abortion compared to the protestant churches because the protestants have done done nothing you know because they don't have any moral standards anymore they just go along with whatever the secular culture thinks and I, i'm afraid to say that this is not just looking at the the bigger 
institutions and this isn't not not just looking at national leaders but i, I was saying this in the um, sermon on understand the bible last week but i will say it here as well that i have experienced worse behavior in the church than i have in the secular world you know that before i was uh, i was ordained in the church of england before i was ordained i had a secular job and even the worst company that i worked for it had a quite a money grabbing kind of a boss but even that was better than the behavior that i've experienced in the church from bishops from from clergy and even from people in in the church bullying and just generally um, unloving and unkind behavior uh, and i think it's because people think they can get away with it because there are no moral standards you know we don't we don't need to treat other people as if you know as we would like to be treated you know as jesus said the golden rule we don't need to love our neighbor as ourselves because god will forgive us anyway you know so we're all flawed we're all sinners so we don't even need to bother to make the effort and um it's it's interesting actually looking back because this is if you look at the reformation this was the exact critique that the the catholic um, the Roman Catholic Church made of Martin Luther and John Calvin and others and they vigorously defended against it but I think that modern Protestant churches have forgotten that defense of it and they've just kind of completely lost the plot on on morality I think this is where we need to recover um, a sort of genuine uh, the spirit of the reformers I think and and, and kind of revisit what they were saying and, and how we need to um, now, how grace actually changes the way that we live that's why i wrote my book confused by grace but uh, let, let's let me let me uh, move on for now anyway so let me quote you from dietrich bonhoeffer and i think i mentioned this before but uh, it's worth mentioning again that the problem with the church now is what what it, what he called cheap grace cheap grace is is the problem this is linked with that sin of presumption that i mentioned the two things are really the same thing so let me quote you from his book the cost of discipleship cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance baptism without church discipline communion without confession absolution without personal confession cheap grace is grace without discipleship grace without the cross grace without jesus christ living and incarnate costly grace is the treasure hidden in the field for the sake of it a man will gladly go and sell all that he has it is the pearl of great price to buy which the merchant will sell all his goods it is the kingly rule of christ for whose sake a man will pluck out the eye which causes him to stumble it is the call of Jesus Christ at which the disciple leaves his nets and follows him. Now, Bonhoeffer was a man who should know what grace was, what the cost of what it meant to follow Jesus, because it cost him his life in the end. And this is, uh, this is I think, what's happened to the church, that the church has substituted what the, the reformers were talking about you know costly grace that the, the grace of jesus christ and substituted it for cheap grace which is a message of well god will forgive you anyway so don't worry too much about it and that's effectively the message which the church preaches now it's not costly grace it's cheap grace now how is this relevant to what's happening with our elites and i hope that you can um, see that relevance but I think the church has basically aided and abetted what's happening with our elites because it's it's left itself unable to speak to questions of personal morality you know, of actual morality and instead only speaks about issues which you know, this sort of secular morality like racism and systemic racism and climate change and you know, all of that sort of stuff uh, which are systemic you know which are corporate and not personal so the church doesn't call people to personal moral change and repentance now it's all about this kind of corporate stuff 
which actually, as we've seen, is a way of getting away from the guilt we feel about our own personal sins. And the church, when it comes to personal morality, basically just affirms people in whatever they want, unless it's, you know, I don't know, something illegal like murder. Of course, we don't affirm people in that. Or maybe, maybe when it comes to abortion in some cases. But, you know, it, it just affirms people. That's, that's all that the church does. God loves you. You're nice. God's nice. Just try a bit harder to be nice. You know, that's basically the message that a lot of churches preach. Not this message of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, personal repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And so I think people, but especially leaders, we've ended up in this in this place where leaders have very little accountability for immoral conduct. This is why, I mean, you know, that book, The Accountability Deficit, but this is why nobody who has done anything wrong over the last few years has really been held to account for it. I mean, when was the last time a leader, a political leader, was actually held to account for decisions that they've made, immoral decisions that they've made? Now, I can't think of a time, actually, really, when they were actually held to account for it. There was a verse, the, the Understand the Bible, Bible study live stream yesterday, we were looking at Isaiah 26, and uh, verse 10 really jumped out at me. But when grace is shown to the wicked, they do not learn righteousness. Even in a land of uprightness, they go on doing evil and do not regard the majesty of the Lord. This is the problem when when grace is shown to the wicked, you know, as it were, when they think that they have God's grace, they think they have God's forgiveness, they think they're on the right side of history and everything, that they it just affirms them in their wickedness and in their evil because they think that they are doing what is morally good. And uh, as Neil Oliver put it, when um, he says, um, this is in one of his monologues, I think a few weeks ago, I'm not sure if this is verbatim, I can't remember exactly, but he said, the wages of sin come in five figures, maybe six. One of his monologues. The wages of sin come in five figures, maybe six. That's all, that's all we'll end up with. You know, that if you if you do anything terrible, it doesn't matter because you're you're going to get rewarded one way or the other and you just deserve that reward no matter what so don't worry about your personal moral failings because actually you don't really have any and it's you know it doesn't matter it just doesn't matter at all morality doesn't matter that's the message that we're getting from the church so let me uh, just take a moment to summarize where we've got to I've given three reasons why our elites are continue to believe that they're the good guys. Number one, they're self-deluded, that they're living in this fantasy world and not actually looking at the truth. And I, I think there is an element there of being convenient. You know, so in other words, they know that if they push on what, what they're being told, then it might crumble. So they don't they don't they don't push. They just accept what they're told, like safe and effective. Yep, yeah, okay, fair enough then, move on, next. They don't push it. Secondly, uh, they are now card-carrying members of a new religion, which substitutes corporate self-flagellation over secular issues, for example, climate change, with personal moral repentance. Or should have put four personal moral, you know, they've, they've exchanged personal morality and, and personal repentance for this self-flagellation over corporate sins, which aren't really sins at all. Um, thirdly, they have been aided and abetted by a church which has lost its moral compass due to cheap grace. Because the church's message, especially the uh, Protestant churches, they all they preach now is that you know, God will forgive you anyway. So th there's no morality there at all. And they don't have the, the ability to speak into the personal moral failings of politicians and the elites because they don't have that moral compass anymore. You know, it's gone. Uh, it's just been replaced by whatever the secular world thinks. So therefore, uh, our elites continue to believe they are the good guys. They continue to wage their wars and other projects with no moral qualms. And they 
actively enforce the morality of the new religion upon us. Now, we have to pay the price for them to ease their own consciences. That is where we are. And it's not a good place to be. I'd just like to finish by quoting from C.S. Lewis on theocracy. I may have quoted this or part of it before, but I think it's it's really good and, uh, and worth quoting again. This is what he had to say. And it's from um, a reply to Professor Haldane. I am a Democrat because I believe that no man or group of men is good enough to be trusted with uncontrolled power over others. And the higher the pretensions of such power, the more dangerous I think it both to rulers and to the subjects. Hence, theocracy is the worst of all governments. If we must have a tyrant, a robber baron is far better than an inquisitor. The baron's cruelty may sometimes sleep, his cupidity at some point may be sated, and since he dimly knows he is doing wrong, he may possibly repent. But the inquisitor who mistakes his own cruelty and lust of power and fear for the voice of heaven will torment us infinitely more because he torments us with the approval of his own conscience and his better impulses appear to him as temptations. And that's astonishing that the inquisitor, you know, those who believe that they are rooting out immorality and um, on the side of the angels, will actually mistake their own cruelty and lust for power for the voice of heaven. And they will torment us more than a robber baron because they do so with the approval of their own consciences. And I think that's where we are just at, at this moment. And C.S. Lewis went on, uh, Since theocracy is the worst, the nearer any government approaches to theocracy, the worse it will be. A metaphysic held by the rulers with the force of a religion is a bad sign. It forbids them, like the Inquisitor, to admit any grain of truth or good in their opponents. It abrogates the ordinary rules of morality, and it gives a seemingly high, super-personal sanction to all the very ordinary human passions by which, like other men, the rulers will frequently be actuated. In a word, it forbids wholesome doubt. A political programme can never in reality be more than probably right. We never know all the facts about the present, and we can only guess the future. To attach to a party programme, whose highest claim is to reasonable prudence, the sort of assent which we should preserve for demonstrable theorems is a kind of intoxication. And so he says that uh, it abrogates the ordinary rules of morality. You know, when we think we are on the side of the angels, on the side of truth, then we don't think about morality. You know, we just think we're the good guys, they're the bad guys, they need to be stamped out. That is what we in the Western world are now seeing, I think, with our governments, that the enemies need to be stamped out because we are the good guys. And they they have, uh, even it says there, uh, the very ordinary human passions, which, you know, they'll, they'll normally be uh, actuated. So in all of the, they're blind, I suppose, to their own flaws. They're blind to their, their prejudices. They are blind to their own moral failings. And this just gives them license then to want to wipe out the bad guys because we are the good guys. So I leave you, I leave you with that. I think there's so much to, to think about here. And there, it just seems to me there's so much wrong in Western, the Western world, in Western secular society at the moment. And this is, I think this goes to the heart of it, actually. How we think of ourselves, how we deal with those who are our enemies. You know, it comes back to that view of ourselves as sinners, I think. This is what's missing. It's what's totally what's totally gone. Let me just quote one more thing. This is from G.K. Chesterton, and I saw this earlier on um, Twitter slash X, um, and uh, I thought this was, really, uh, this was really helpful. All nations have sins, and tyranny may be Russia's, but England's sin is a lack of the conviction of sin. And I thought that was really helpful, a lack of the conviction of sin. That is our problem. Well, let's uh, let's move on now to just a, a brief reflection from the Bible. And uh, I thought um, this was actually the passage that I read this morning, uh, just a brief passage from 1, 1 Corinthians, just the end of um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I'll read uh, verses uh, 29 to 34. 
Now, if there is no resurrection, what will those do who are baptised for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptised for them? And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I face death every day. Yes, just as surely as I boast about you in Christ Jesus our Lord. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus with no more than human hopes, what have I gained? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning, for there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. And what Paul is, these words really leapt out at me this morning because it seems to, to me, and this is what Paul is, his argument is, that the resurrection changes everything about how we live. You know, we shouldn't live as those who live in fear anymore. So as Paul says, you know, why, if there's no resurrection, then why do I live in danger? You know, my, I face death every day, he says. You think about the way that our society has dealt with death over, well, especially over the last few years. But before that, we have a very unhealthy relationship with death. And Paul says, no, I face death every day and I can do that because of the resurrection. But then he goes on to say, um, if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. And if the dead are not raised, then what we need to do is extract every ounce of pleasure and every ounce of you know, everything we can from this life. You know, because what, what's the point in facing death if there is no resurrection? You, know, you, you want everything, everything has to be now. That's the only option. And, um, and then it, it seems like there are, there's this tension between two different view, worldviews going on. You know, the let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die brigade, and then the I face death every day you know, brigade. And Paul is saying that the Christian way is to, you know, to face death, to say there is a resurrection, and that does change how we live. And he says, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. There are some who are ignorant of God, and I say this to your shame. And part of the, part of the problem that I think Paul is dealing with is that this church in Corinth had become corrupted by these people who were saying, uh, let it, effectively saying, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. And there's no resurrection. And that's what they were, 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 were living. And I wonder if that is part of the problem in our church today as well, that it's been corrupted by people who are basically have a, have a secular view, who say there's not, they don't say there's no resurrection, but they live as if there's no resurrection. They say that this life, the secular life, is the only thing that matters. And that we need to live to maximise this life because the resurrection is not, uh, you know, we, we don't pay any attention to that at all. And if that is the case, then what is it doing to our churches? You know, bad company corrupts good character. And I thought it was just worth reflecting on that and thinking, well, what can we do? What can we do? You know, thinking about our churches that we're in, what can we do? Are we being corrupted? What can we do? To, to rid ourselves of this influence and actually keep ourselves pure, keep ourselves thinking about the resurrection, keep ourselves thinking rightly about uh, how we live in the light of the resurrection. So I just offer that as, a, as something for you to think about, just a little reflection about how we live. So uh, I know that in all of these things, I mean, there's been a lot in the podcast and um, you know, I hope that it's been helpful but I think it's it's important as we finish to take a moment to pray and offer it all to God and trust that God, you know, although we I so often pray this way, thinking, well, I can't make any sense of this. You know, we have to offer it to God and ask God to help. So let's take a moment to do that as we close. And so, Heavenly Father, we know that there are so many problems in the world today and uh, we keep coming back to these issues uh, on the podcast, just how particularly so many Western uh, leaders seem to have an unshakable belief that they are the good guys. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that as, um, as a church, that you would help us, and as Christians, you would help us, Lord, to, uh, to hold out that message of personal repentance, of responsibility, moral responsibility before you, knowing that there is uh, grace available for the sinner 
in Jesus Christ. There is real costly grace, not cheap grace, which leaves us where we are, but uh, costly grace, which leads us to repentance. And we pray that that message will be heard in our uh, well, friends and families, in our communities, in our towns and across this world, Lord. And we pray that many would would seek you. And we pray for wisdom in how how we uh, deal with others, especially in the church, who uh, perhaps not living in the light of the resurrection. And we ask that you would give us wisdom about how we we deal with and cope with these things. So we pray for your guiding, guiding hand in the way forward and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks so much, everyone, for joining me today. Uh, don't forget, if you're on YouTube, like, subscribe. If you're listening to the audio podcast, then please do give me a rating, even a review, as that will help other people to find the podcast uh, if you can. And uh, do share and the Give, Send, Go, and on Telegram and email, all of that stuff. I'd love to hear from you. So God bless. I'll see you again next week. Uh, take care.